let's just review uh, the journey so far. You know we're going through the entire Gospel of Matthew. We can see that Matthew is divided into three main sections. We have an introduction and we see Jesus entering into his Galilean uh, ministry. And later on, um, we will find him getting into a conflict as he goes into Jerusalem. And we know how that turned out. But in the end, um, we know that there's a resurrection and there's a commission right behind. So for the last two phases, or for last year in 2015, we only covered all the way through from chapter 1, verse 1 to chapter 5, verse 1. Like I said, it's quite an achievement. We're going verse by verse, passage by passage. We, we don't get to determine the topic we want to teach. The text determines where we should go. And I've been very challenged. The one who studies the Word, the one who prepares, actually learns the most. And so I pray that you will get into some opportunity or some situation where you have to teach. Uh, and it really stretches you. And I find that you know, as much as we want to talk about kingdom living, I'm living so far from what Jesus is really saying, okay? And I'm going through the topics and I'm learning and it's just been crazy. And I, I realize that's why we need Jesus. That's why we need the Holy Spirit, amen? All right, so just a quick um, review. We covered things like the genealogy in chapter 1 and we found that Jesus, you know, comes from the line of obviously Abraham and David. We spoke about Old Testament prophecy and Matthew is really uh, hammering home to say, look, this is the Messiah. This is the one that the Old, Pro Old Testament prophets have been all talking about as a fulfillment. We are given the name of Jesus and even in that name, we, we see um, a, a messianic mission that He comes to save His people from their sins. And He's Emmanuel, He's going to be with us and He will not forsake us. Uh, Matthew does a lot of parallels uh, comparing Jesus as a, uh, uh, with, with Israel, or if you like to put it the other way, Israel as a type that would, uh, would, would be founded or fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. There's an identification of Jesus as the new Israel, as we see through a new exodus, uh, Jesus in the wilderness, temptation, and now you know, he appears in a public ministry. We also understand that Jesus, um, at the appointed time, He says, this is it right now, okay? I'm going to get back into Galilee and we are going to begin. He was already in ministry before that. And if you missed that teaching, you know, do catch up on that. And where we talk about the disciples and also the multitudes later on. The moment the time is right, He goes out declaring the word of the kingdom. He doesn't just declare the word of the kingdom, He demonstrates the power of the kingdom. And He was healing Everyone that came to him in the Decapolis and all the regions. And after that, we read about the disciples and we talk about the multitudes. And Jesus is now bringing the community together. And so we end with chapter 4 and we went into chapter 5, verse 1. And that is the verse that we're going to start with this evening. So before we read the scripture, shall we just pray together? Lord, we thank you once again for your word, Lord. This is not just any old word, not any old book, Lord. It says that it is Holy Spirit inspired. It is God breathed, O oh Lord. And so I pray that the same inspiration that was given to Matthew and the other writers, that this evening, that same inspiration will come within our hearts, O oh Lord. That you will awaken us from within, O oh Lord. That our eyes will be open to see what you want us to see and to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches at this point. And so, Lord, be with me and be with my brothers and sisters. That, Lord, we're going to have a great time worshipping you through the declaration of this word. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. From the New King James Bible. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on the mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying. Two verses, but we're going to just observe a few things from these two verses first. That's only going to be that first section. Then later on in the second section, we're going to move into what we understand as the Sermon on the Mount. And it starts with the Beatitudes. And in the third section, God help me with this, we will do a quick summary of what the sermon is. So tonight is really setting the tone and giving an introduction 
Because from next week onwards, and only the Lord knows how many sessions we will take, we are going to plot through the Sermon on the Mount. So I think it's very important that we understand the introduction and the context so that when you remember this, you will have a better appreciation of what Jesus is trying to teach us right through the entire sermon. So let's look at our first observation. It says that Jesus goes up onto this mountain, He sits down and He, he teaches them. The question we have to ask first is, who did Jesus teach? Now I know this question is like a very obvious one. It's, of course we know, you know, I mean, uh, the, the people who were there, but who was there, right? There, there were two groups of people that were mentioned. One is the disciples, and the second group would be the multitudes, We're told that all these people, they were like harassing him, following him. But when he saw the multitudes, that's what we read, right? He went, he goes up onto the mountain and then his disciples came to him. And so one understanding could be the disciples came to Jesus and so Jesus taught them. Definitely, without a doubt, Jesus would have been teaching his disciples. Now, does it mean that he did not teach the multitudes at all? No, we understand and we believe that the multitudes got to hear what Jesus was teaching the disciples. Because if you go all the way back into Matthew chapter 7 and verse 28, it says that when Jesus had ended these sayings, that the people, now it doesn't say multitudes, but in the Greek it's exactly the same word. Multitudes and the people both are translated from the same Greek word. They were astonished at his teachings. So did they get to hear the teachings? Yes. It was publicly declared. He, it was addressed to his disciples, but it was also given to the entire gathering of people who were there, inviting them to follow him at a closer, in a, in a much closer way than they were just looking for healing and looking for ministry. So that's the very first observation. I want to suggest to you that if you are not clear between the terms disciple and multitudes, do pick up and do listen to the teachings that we've gone through because I, I take time to define these two terms which many people are confused with or they think or they take for granted what they actually mean. The second observation we see is Jesus goes up onto a mountain. Now this is not just a geographic description Because the mountain is very significant. Every time you look at the Bible or in the Gospels and you find Jesus on the mountain, this is what you want to remember, okay? Mountains are high places. Mountains are places of worship. And when the people were worshiping idols, they would also build things up on the high places. And so when Jesus gets up on the mountain, this one is significant because it points back to a time where there was another mountain called Mount Sinai. Moses at Mount Sinai, he received the law from God. Jesus now comes onto that mountain and he stands as God and King and he delivers the law. And he gives a teaching and an explanation on it. Now, of course, you know what comes out from that reception of the law is what we understand as the Torah or in the Greek called the Pentateuch. Now, do you realize also that the Sermon on the Mount is the very first of five sermons or five discourses that Matthew records. The first one points to or points back to Moses and talks about the law. The second discourse really starts with the commissioning of the twelve and is like symbolic of a Joshua getting into the land and bringing conquest. The third one is really surrounding the parables of the kingdom in Matthew chapter 13. Just before that, Solomon is mentioned. And so there is an allusion to the wisdom of understanding what the mystery of the kingdom is all about. The fourth one talks about the community of the king because in Matthew chapter 18, suddenly Jesus is now talking about the church, i.e. a group of people that would be called out, separated, And it's like Elijah during the time of the kingdom where he had to bring out a group of people outside the kingdom because the people in the kingdom were not living kingdom. Does that make sense? So it's like a new community being constituted, one who will be set apart, separated unto God. 
And the Olivet Discourse, of course, we know, that talks about the end of days and Jesus giving the signs of the times, Matthew chapter 23 to 25 alludes to Jeremiah and the prophets where they declare that the temple will no longer be needed or no longer will be there. So these are five discourses and Lord willing, we will go through them one at a time and we'll see how the Lord will just lead us through this. So on the mountain shows us that Jesus is the one who is greater than Moses. And he's leading the people out in a new exodus. He's going to give the people a new covenant. He's going to constitute a new people. And for the law, there will be a new enablement. This is Jesus on the mountain. The third observation we see from these two verses is that when he was seated, now that's an important point. Because the recording here is pointing to a rabbinic custom. And the rabbis, when they teach, they don't stand. It is a rabbinic custom for rabbis to sit. And it actually means a lot more. When they sit, they speak with authority. Do you remember the verse in Luke where Jesus walks into the synagogue and he reads the scroll from Isaiah? And after he reads it, he closed the book, he gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down. You see that? Today, we sit down first, and we're invited, and then we stand up. But in those days, when he sits down, and when he starts to teach, he teaches. It's a symbol of authority. We also see this in the time of Pilate. When Pilate, after he hears all the things, and he makes a judgment, he brings Jesus out. And he sits down in the judgment seat. Okay, so this shows you that Jesus was actually sitting in a place of authority. You and I know that today Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. What is he doing? He is seated at the right hand of the Father. Amen. There is an authority of Jesus Christ. So when Jesus goes up to the mountain and he sits down, he actually assumed a posture and a position of authority, not just as a rabbi, and he was definitely a good one, but as the Messiah. He is the king. That's the authority. So three things, three observations. We're going to get to the fourth observation of these first two verses because it will set for us the tone of what we will learn after this. There's a very interesting phrase, right? He goes up on the mountain after sitting down. It's recorded... And he opened his mouth and he taught them. Now today we look at this one phrase and we will say, doesn't it sound very redundant? You know, how do you teach someone without opening your mouth? So obviously you must open your mouth and then you can teach them. So some modern translations, they have removed that phrase. It just says that he sat down and he taught. Only the King James, the the ESV and NASV, they, they retain this one phrase. And the commentators, the scholars, they've gone back, they've looked at this, and they realize actually this is a Jewish or a Hebrew idiom. It's an idiom, it's a phrase that they are familiar with. So you see, in the book of Acts, it's also recorded, Philip opened his mouth, and beginning at the scripture, he preached Jesus to the Ethiopian eunuch. In Acts chapter 10, verse 34, Peter opened his mouth and then he said, so it's recorded. In the Old Testament, Job chapter 3 verse 1, after this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. There's another recording in Daniel chapter 10 verse 16. Suddenly, having the, one having the likeness of the Son of Man touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and I spoke. And it came to a conclusion after studying all this that when you use this phrase, it indicates a seriousness, an importance of what is being said. That's how critical this one phrase is. And so this is not a redundant phrase, but one that indicates the solemnity and the seriousness of what is being said. So what follows after this is important. Okay, whatever he's going to teach, very, very important. 
And so we have to ask the question, how serious was Jesus? How serious was Jesus? Because there are many people who read the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, almost naturally that question comes. Well, how to live like that? Right? Have you read through the Sermon on the Mount? Have you gone through the Beatitudes? If you have not, you know, do that as homework over the next few weeks. And I can assure you, as you go through the Scripture, you're like, oh, I cannot make it, man. This is really difficult. So do you think Jesus was really serious? You know, what do you think? And over the centuries and over the years, there have been different views. Like, for example, in the medieval age, they looked at this whole passage and they said, oh, no, no, I cannot. I think it's only for the clergy. Wow, very convenient, huh? Right? So today, it's almost like you going back to church and you say, Pastor, it's only for you and the church worker. For us, huh? no, lah. I don't think Jesus was that serious with us. Then there was also another view after that. They said, oh, no, no, it's only for the short term. This is called the interim ethic uh, uh, view. You know why it's called the short term? Why only for the short term? Because Jesus said, I'm coming back very soon, right? So in those days, they just say, okay, very soon, right? So, tahan dampo lah. You just live like that, huh? Well, I cannot slap one side, I give you the other cheek, you know, I have to forgive, I loon, I forgive. Uh, you know, I tan, you know, because it's only for a short time. Jesus come back already, it's okay. Then slowly, slowly, Jesus never come back, right? Then, then they start to think, uh, okay, uh, uh, maybe, you know, uh, Jesus, are you serious now? Do you think this is really seriously for us? Do you really expect us to live like this? And since we can't live it now, someone comes up with this view and says, oh, no, no, it's called a dispensational view. It's for the future kingdom. Meaning now, there's no way we can live like that. Lah. But when Jesus comes for us and we're in the kingdom, uh, oh, automatically we'll know how to live like that. So for now, don't bother about it. And so we just disregard it. You know, these are nice suggestions. And more recently, we're hearing this. No, no, it's only for those in the old covenant. This is called the pre-cross view, right? Yeah? Because this is before the cross. So Jesus hasn't, hadn't died yet, you know, and uh, there's, there's no church yet. And so this is pre-cross. That means only for people in the old covenant. So you and I, we are in the new covenant. So we don't have to bother about it. Lah. All right, so these three chapters can throw away. Next few weeks, oh dear, I don't know what I'm saying. I was, I was going to say you don't have to come. <laughs> Sounds interesting, right? All these views. And do you realize that they, they try to rationalize why it's not for us today? But let's con consider a few things. Firstly, the Gospel of Matthew was written pre-cross or post-cross? Post. After that. Inspired by the Holy Spirit. So obviously, I, I, I believe that the Holy Spirit thinks that the church needs to hear this. It's not there for no reason, Right? Every part of Scripture is important. Secondly, we have already established this. It's addressed to all disciples of Jesus Christ. Everyone who is a disciple. And in my books and in my understanding, you know my position, right? If you say you believe in Jesus Christ, you are a disciple. You don't have to wait for three years to become a disciple automatically you are a follower of Jesus Christ. Do you think this applies to you? I believe this applies to you. Thirdly, Matthew chapter 28, tw uh, verse, ch verse 20, says that we have to teach, we have to make disciples to teach them to observe how many things? All things. So it has to be all things. How do we decide which part we want to leave out? It, it doesn't make sense, you understand? And that's why people are saying, uh, or giving certain thoughts on this to say that, oh, uh, this part is, is not relevant anymore, or oh, that part is not relevant anymore, we have to take this out, you know, and be before you know it, you're taking everything out just because you, you don't like it. So do you think Jesus was serious? I think he was very, very serious. He opened his mouth. The Bible tells us, with full authority, and with full seriousness, I think he's saying to us, please pay attention to all these things. We shouldn't make excuses for ourselves. We shouldn't rationalize just because we cannot live up to a certain standard of who Jesus is. But let's go on. We have to understand 
what the Sermon on the Mount actually is. See, when we use this phrase, the Sermon on the Mount, we just think it's a sermon. I like the way John Stott puts it. He says it's the nearest thing to a manifesto. That's a very strong word. The nearest thing to a manifesto that Jesus ever uttered. For it is his own description of what he wanted his followers to be and to do. I looked at this one word called manifesto, a very big word, four syllables. And I like to study the origin of that word. And so it comes from the Latin manifestus, which means obvious, to make obvious. And later on it became manifesto, which means to make public. So here is the king making things very obvious and very clear. David Platt says it in a different way. He says that the Sermon on the Mount teaches us what it means to be a citizen of Christ's kingdom. Plain English. This is what it is. So if you consider yourself a member of the kingdom, do you think this is for you? If you call yourself a citizen of the kingdom, then you can't run away from it. This is what it is. And that's why we have to look at it, we have to understand it, and we have to interpret it correctly and ask the Lord to teach us and show us how we can go about fulfilling it. But before we do that, we have to look at what the Sermon on the Mount is not. I'm going to give you four statements down here. Firstly, it's not a list of things to do that we may be accepted by God. Do you sometimes feel that way? No? It, it, you shouldn't see it that way. Can I encourage you and affirm you that we are accepted by God because of what Jesus has already done? Amen? So please understand this very, very first point. It is not something you have to do to collect points, you know, so that you, know, you will uh, uh, get into the favor of God. That's not the point. Drawing from that then, it is then not about salvation. This Sermon on the Mount, this manifesto is not about salvation. It's about character. It's about conduct of those who have been saved by Christ. That's the whole difference. So please don't go through chapters 5, 6, and 7 and, and, think that, and, and, and feel that if I don't make it, then I will lose my salvation. That's not the point. The third thing, because it's not about salvation, it's not about being accepted, then this is not the good news, per se, of the kingdom. Jesus declared, He said, you know, I'm, I'm going to preach the good news of the kingdom, but now as I declare that good news, now I'm telling you that this would be the ways of the kingdom. This is how you need to live in the kingdom. The good news is that I'm going to be king. The good news is I'm going to save you out of a terrible kingdom. The good news is that I'm going to rule with righteousness. I'm going to rule really nicely with peace. There's going to be joy. Yay, good news. Now, this is the way to live in it. You see the difference here? And so, it's not a list of things that we have to try to climb into God's favor. It's not about salvation. It's not about the gospel. And the most important thing on this fourth point is, it is not achieved by self-effort but by the enablement of the Holy Spirit. Now, this is important because if you read these three chapters and you try to do, oh man, you'll be disappointed, right? And you can, you can have very good intention. Lord, I want to love you. This why, that's why I'm trying to do this. You're going to fail. It is just not possible. And there's one verse I'm going to give to you. I, I want you to take it down. And you go med meditate on this one. And it's in Romans chapter 8, verse 3 that explains to us why we have to come into an understanding of the Holy Spirit. Verse 3, For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin, He condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Did you get that? Right? That the righteous requirement of the law will be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit to help us in this one. This is the key. 
as you are going through verse by verse, week after week, please understand this. We need the work of the Holy Spirit in each and every one of our hearts. How's that for an introduction, my friends? Okay, this is just a context. I want you to see the observations of those four verses. And as Jesus opens his mouth and begins to teach the Sermon on the Mount, understand what it is and understand what it's not and understand how we need the enablement of the Holy Spirit. And so now for the rest of the time, let me welcome you to Mount Makarios. Now you may be wondering, what is this macaroon thing? It's not a cafe, it's not you know, anything I'm offering you for dessert. The word makarios is the original word for what we normally see as beatitude. And so we call it the beatitudes. If you go back into, again, the origin, the word beatitude comes from the Latin beatus. Beatus just means blessed. And so you have this uh, eight blessings, if you call it, right? Uh, blessed are these, blessed are those, blessed are these, blessed are those. This is where we get this word beatitude. Now, no one taught me this, but thank God for Google nowadays, right? You can find this out by yourself. And I, want, I, want to ins- I hope to instill in each of us a certain inquisitiveness. Do you understand what I'm saying? You know, that you can find out these things. Otherwise, in church, at Beatitudes, oh, yeah, Beatitudes, oh. And then the pastor will say, you know why it's called the Beatitudes? Because it's the be attitude. No, the attitude that we have to be. Like, oh, wow, so clever. But you still don't understand what the Beatitude is. Okay? It actually means a state of utmost bliss. So makarios simply means blessedness. Blessedness. Oh, the blessedness, you know. And that's what Jesus was actually declaring. The, the blessedness, the state of blessedness. If you are a person of the kingdom, you, are, you have come into that state of blessedness. A mountain of blessedness, you know, if I use Mount makarios, you know, literally. Okay? That's what he was declaring. But to understand this, Greek word a little bit more, let's go into the usage, you know, in how they used to apply this. This word makarios wasn't used for any old Tom, Dick or Harry, okay? They, in ancient Greek, they would only use this word to refer to the gods because the gods were of a higher order. They were higher beings. So these were the gods. They, they are blessed. Only the gods could have the blessed state that we are talking about. Later on, they would use makarios to refer to the dead, human beings, to the dead. You know why? Because they have gone to the other world and they have been promoted to be gods. And that's why they are blessed. Right? So sometimes we say of our dearly departed that they have gone to a better place, no more suffering, more blessed. Not. That's what we think. Huh? So they are the same idea, you see. It refers to the dead. Then, they sort of brought it a little bit closer to home, and it now refers to the elite, the powerful, the wealthy. And so you look at these people who drive the BMWs and the Mercedeses and the, you know, all the big cars, and you know, they're, they're going all over the place. Oh, these are the blessed ones. They are the makarios. Okay? The, the, the blessedness of these people. But when it was used in the Old Testament, it would refer to right living, which results in the good life, maybe a good family, you know, having a good wife, having good children, and uh, when your children are obedient, and you know, people always look at you and say, oh, you're so blessed. Right, yeah? But if the children are not obedient, then they don't look at you and say, so blessed. Right, yeah? Or material possessions. So in the Old Testament, we call it the Deuteronomistic theology. If you do something right, it, re- it, it will yield a good result. It will yield blessings. But you notice it's also very material. It's all about possessions. Yeah? And Jesus suddenly comes onto the scene and he invites everyone. This is the good news of the kingdom and this is the way the kingdom is. And I declare over you blessedness. I declare over you the state of bliss. 
But here comes the catch. He declares it, but just not in the way the world understands it. Because if you look down the eight statements after that, you look at it and you say, like that one, uh, like that you call blessed. Uh. You know, how can we understand that? But you see, the king invites us into his kingdom to his kingdom blessedness. And just like he tells Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. You're not going to understand it if you're going to think with this worldly understanding. And so if we want to come to this king and we want to align with the kingdom, we have to learn things all over again. That's the Greek understanding. Let me give you a word study to go into the Hebrew understanding. And someone actually wrote it in this way. He says it's like the thrill of the spirit of the traveler who is about to reach his goal. Not quite there yet, but almost. You know, and that that's, he's been on a long, hard journey, but he's on the right path, and he's almost home. That's how the Hebrews would look at this blessedness. That means not quite, but that's there. All right? There's that's, that's an anticipation. There's this excitement. So when I read this one phrase, the first thing that came into my mind was, it, it feels like a, like a race, doesn't it? Uh, if you're running a marathon or, or, or a long enough distance, it, it's like a race. That There's a thrill as you are coming to the end. But it's all the end. Those of you who are runners, the most exciting part is in front and behind. When you start, and you, Whoa, there's this acceleration. It's like, man, I'm going to really do really well. And right at the end, there's excitement. So there's acceleration in the beginning. And there's excitement at the end. But this is really pushed right at the ends. But what's in the middle? In the middle, exasperation and it calls for endurance, right? If you're really running a, a long race. And I look at the list of beatitudes and it's true. I, I like the first word, blessed. Who doesn't like that word, blessed? Whichever way you want to pronounce it. And there's an acceleration in that, oh, the blessedness of and then right at the end, this is the kingdom of God. For they shall be comforted. They shall be filled. You know, it's so exciting, right? But what's in between? Blessed are the poor in spirit. But this is the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> Blessed are those who are persecuted. For this is the kingdom. Are you, are you following me? You know, and, and this is like, we're excited with what Jesus has for us. We're excited with what's going to happen, you know, when we finally come to the end of that long, hard journey. But what is also true is that in between is the living out of that blessed state. So finally, they concluded the best translation for this word, makarios or eschrei, is congratulations. You know, it's like a, you got it, man, you know? And it's like saying... Re receiving this shout from, from the stands. You know? You're on the right track. You're, you're going to make it. And when Jesus is the one declaring it as, a, as one who is God, it's like a, a word of affirmation and a word of approval that comes from God Himself. It's like God smiling upon each and every one of us. And He says, you are my kingdom. You are blessed. However you are feeling, whatever you may be going through, I am smiling and approval upon you. The world may look at you and, and step on you and you may not agree with whatever you are doing and however things might be coming upon you, but I want you to know this. You are blessed as you are going through. You are blessed. And I'm smiling upon you and I'm approving you. That's what we must start with. Because if you start the other way around, then it's like, oh man, cannot make it. We start with a declaration of blessedness. Amen? And that's what we are. So let's look at this mountain of blessedness. I definitely want to receive everything there is in it for me. And I'm sure you also want to do it. But it's like, I want to get up this this mountain of blessedness, I, 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 and, and there's this lift down there that, that I can walk in, that I can climb up, or I can, I can get up. But as I enter this lift, the only buttons available are those 
that take me down to the basement level. B1, B2, B3, B4, B5, B6, B7, B8. Do you feel that way sometimes? Yeah. And there, there's a little lesson down there. Because the way up Mount Makarios is down. And this is what's so difficult for so many of us to, to grasp. And even as we come to say, yeah, okay, I understand it's upside down. It's so difficult for us to accept, is it not? And it's so difficult for us to lift this out. It's upside down. And there are many writers who, who say this. You know, we, we tend to see it upside down. But what if Jesus was trying to come to, to turn things right side up? It takes a total realignment, don't you see? Now you understand the three words that we have here in, in our Keeper's Awakening, right? That, that there's an awakening, but the awakening is like, okay, fine, that's only the first step. The second step is that you've got to get aligned. You've got to get aligned with God. You don't just come and say, okay, fine, you know, I'm ready now, Lord. And the Lord says, okay, fine, you're ready, come. Let's go. Blessed are you. And then <laughs> B1, B2, B3, B4. <laughs> it's upside down. It's counterculture. Totally counterculture. Just recently, I just bumped into someone. He, he, was, he was very upset because someone had actually betrayed him, okay? Played him out, literally. What would Jesus want us to do? Forgive, right? How to do? It's counterculture, right? The world will tell you, sue this guy, man. Make sure his pants come off, right? How to forgive? It's counterculture, it's upside down. And Jesus is trying to show us something. That when we come into the kingdom, it's no longer about us. It's not about trying harder. It's not about doing more. It's not about gaining power and control. It's about surrender. Just pause and just ponder this phrase. And compare this with what we are taught usually in management and training and consultancy courses. Go for your strength, man. Maximize your potential. The sky is the limit. Believe in yourself. Have you heard all these phrases? They say this over and over again. You know what's a scary thing, my friends? We are preaching it in church today. If you can, means you can. God has made you with the potential. And we just throw one word, God, in. Now, the statements are not false. We do have that potential, amen? We do have strengths. We do have abilities. The question is, will we surrender? Today, we want to climb on top. Today, we want to have most things. We want to be rich. We want to be famous. We want to be pat on the back. You know, Jesus says, blessedness is not defined that way. You want mak makarios? Basement one, basement two, basement three, <laughs> basement four. And this is the crazy thing for us. And if you read the text over and over again, you'll find that it starts with being poor in spirit first a brokenness in our hearts and our spirits. When we have come to a point when we say, Lord, I, 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 you're right, I, I just can't. I just can't. Okay, the, the moment you go, I think I can, uh, that's going to be a problem already. It's that yieldedness, that surrender that comes to a point to say, Lord, I've been trying. You know? And the, the sad thing is for many of us, we only discover it when we turn about 50. It's called midlife crisis. Huh? Before that, young, uh, anything also can, chong swan, kui hai. Right? Uh, I can climb every mountain, I can cross any sea. And we try, we try, we try, we try. Until we come to one point, we say, Lord, you are right, I surrender. You better help me. Amen? And this is what it is, that surrender. And I, I submit to you, my friends, it is that moment, that point when we acknowledge and we realize and acknowledge that we surrender, that's when the rule and reign of God 
breaks in. Do you realize that? How do you have a king reign over you when you don't surrender? Can all that? It's that moment when you come to that realization and say, Lord, I submit, I yield, I'm broken. The kingdom of God breaks in. That's it. And I was preparing this. This one line came to me. You know, today it's all about possess the land, possess the kingdom. I tell you something, my friends. To possess the kingdom is to be first possessed by the king. Amen? You want to possess the kingdom? You want everything the kingdom has for you? Let the king have everything of you. Because he came to buy you out in the first place. You are no longer your own. The faster you realize that, the better. And that's when the kingdom of God breaks through. I think we're having our own kingdom invasion right now. See, we've got to come to that realization. Otherwise, you'll look like that. Right? You look at this character from, from the movie uh, Inside Out, right? Sadness. You look like that. I bless the poor in spirit. I must mourn. I must meager. You know, and then some Christians some will, will act like this. You know? Oh, no, I'm not good enough. Oh, that, that's wrong. You understand? Not? You are blessed. You are blessed. You have kingdom blessedness. You understand? But the world doesn't understand it. And that's why it comes against you. And that's why it breaks you down into a point where you can then receive the fullness of what God has for you. You want an example? The best example I give you is Jesus. Theologians call this the kenosis of the Christ. The word kenosis means the self-emptying. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. Who took the lift down to basement? Jesus. That's the example. The king gives us an example. And a beautiful thing about the Beatitudes from B1 to B8 is that if you notice that the first one, blessed are, the, are those who are poor in spirit, or blessed are the poor in spirit, for this is the kingdom of heaven. And you go all the way right to the end, B8, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for this is the kingdom of heaven. You notice the first one and the eighth one, last one, they are both in present tense. But the rest... Will be, shall be comforted, will be comforted, or will inherit the earth, or will be filled. Amen? So can you see there's both a juxtaposition of a present reality as well as a future culmination. And this shows us that the kingdom is both here and now and not yet. Okay? I understand that other people who teach that the kingdom is fully here, for at this time, this is my own, I, I still believe. The kingdom is here, but it's not yet. We have to know within our hearts, ours is the kingdom of heaven. We will receive the kingdom of heaven. The blessedness is something that we can enjoy at this time. But because it's also not yet, you will realize that it will not be in its fullness. And some we will receive now. We will be comforted now but some will be comfortable fully later. We will be healed in part now, but we will be healed fully later. Am I consistent? And it is this tension that we have to hold on to, that we have to look to what we can experience fully that keeps us going. See, it says of Jesus in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, right? In verse 1, it tells you to run the race with endurance. Don't let anything hold you back so that you can look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith, who for the joy set before Him, who for the joy set before Him, endured the cross. And now He's seated at the right hand of the Father. And so whatever you are going through, 
You can live as right as you want by the power of God and by His grace. And I can tell you, you can live as right as you want and someone will still come and irk you like no end. Everyone say amen. You know what I'm talking about. Right? There's no guarantee. So does that mean you're not blessed? No. You are blessed too. But you look to the joy that's set before you. And because of that, you go on through the exasperation with endurance, waiting for the excitement to come close to that. And you hear that word, makarios. Congratulations. You're almost there. And there's a smile that comes upon us. Isn't that awesome? This is what Jesus is trying to share with all of us. And so you start with B1 to B8, the Beatitudes, the blessed statements. And I want you to remember that verses 3 to 12 is like the text of Jesus' sermon. You know, traditionally in the churches, this is what we do, right? We'll read a passage of Scripture and then we will unpack it. The blessed statements were Jesus' text. After that, he unpacks it. I'm pausing. I want you to catch this. Because many times, we will study the other portions and we will divorce it from the Beatitudes. But you, you cannot. You, you have to understand this part first. Let me give you an example. Later on, Jesus would teach about marriage or you will teach about forgiveness or you will teach about going the extra mile or turning the other cheek. It stems from here. Can you understand this now? Okay, if you miss this, then you're trying to just turn the other cheek, turn the other cheek, you know, or go to the extra mile, go to the extra mile. But you have to anchor it based on these eight statements to understand this and then to apply it and by the Holy Spirit to help you. If you miss this, you will miss the teachings that will follow. So with this as the text, there are many ways to structure the Sermon on the Mount. But I looked at it and one word caught my attention. And that word is a simple, therefore. And I realized that there are seven therefores. Actually, a bit more, but I've grouped it into seven because it can be grouped into seven. So I've used the seven therefores like a conclusion to help me identify the seven-point sermon. So after he declares blessedness, the first thing he does is he declares identity. He says, I want you to know who you are. You are the salt. You are the light. Don't you ever forget this. The kingdom people, right? I've already declared the full thing over you now. Now you must know who you are. And in who, knowing who you are, you understand your function, so you will do what you need to do. But how will you do what you need to do? He declares the law and prophets. Don't think I've come to eliminate the law and the prophets, right? That's what he, he tells the, the people. After he says, you are salt and you are light, he says, don't think I've come to destroy this. Just because I've asked you to do something doesn't mean you anyhow go and do. Everything will be fulfilled. But your righteousness must be a correct righteousness. And then he says, therefore, whoever breaks the least of these commandments and teaches men will be called the least. Whoever does and teaches them shall be called great. Can you see the first therefore? Very important, right? Know who you are, but you better know the law and you'll be great in the kingdom. Isn't it funny that today people tell us that you don't need the law? This is really odd, right? Then after he goes, but just in case you don't understand what righteousness is, you have heard it said like this, but I say to you, so he does a clarification and he gives an interpretation. So he goes, number one, number two, and there are six of them, right? Number three, by the time I come to number six, huh? 
All the people are like, oh man, I cannot make it. And then he wags with this one statement, therefore, be perfect. Just as your heavenly father is perfect. After that, he teaches about hiddenness. Whatever you do, huh, don't let your left hand know what your right hand do. When you pray, huh, don't stand outside uh, and wayang. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. When you fast, don't go around with a long face and tell everybody how hungry you are or how spiritual you are. Do it quietly and your Father in heaven will reward you. And that therefore is found inside this entire paragraph that says don't be like the hypocrites. Don't follow them. And then he goes on and talks about treasures. So you want to keep in kingdom blessedness? Then you better make sure your treasures are the correct treasures. Because there will be distractions. You cannot worship God and you cannot worship mammon together. You will love one and hate the other and you will hate one and you'll love the other. So understand what kingdom treasures are all about. And this is where in this one therefore are three therefores. Isn't that interesting? And you know, all the three therefores say the same thing. Therefore, do not worry. Therefore, do not worry. Therefore, do not worry. I think Jesus knows something about us. If you get your treasures wrong, you will be worrying, worrying, worrying. So you must say it three times so that you understand. After that comes a very famous passage, 7.1, do not judge, which everyone quotes out of context. I hope we'll get to that soon enough so we can learn the right interpretation. But actually it ends with again, this is the law and prophets. Whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. This is the law and prophets. So he starts with the law and prophets. He closes in that sense with the law and prophets and it's about justice and it's about mercy. Both. Both and. You cannot take one and throw the other out. Another word for mercy is called grace. And here comes the next section where now you have to make a choice. Now he has taught you everything. He's declared everything over you. The manifesto is very, very clear. Now he tells you there's a broad way and there's a narrow way. Now you choose. Very clear, right, this sermon? Now you choose. But as you choose, you be careful, okay? Because there will be deceptions. There will be false prophets. He tells you how to identify them. You'll know them by their fruit. And it comes to the last section. I call it the Father's will. Because this is the part where he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Now Christians don't like this passage. Not everyone who calls my name, or Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. So it's the Father's will. What does it mean for us? Your kingdom assignments, amen? Am I preaching from the text? Kingdom assignment. You, you've got to know what this is. Not any, oh, how? Go down there, cast here, cast there. You go where the Father sends you. This is part of His will. And then it says that whoever hears these words of mine, He does them, this is the wise man. So it's about obedience. This is the manifesto. And then finally He concludes. After looking at this structure, I looked at it and I said, wow, I've never seen it so clear, <laughs> for myself at least. And I was, I've been so challenged this past week of just putting this together. As I look at this, I realize I have understood the Beatitudes wrongly. You know, I have dissected this in, into little different parts, you know, just to be a better Christian or, you know, just to be a nicer guy. You know, I want to walk in the correct way. And in, the, in that sense, along the way, we end up being like a Pharisee. But when I look at this structure and I'm looking at this whole teaching again, I said, Lord, you better help me because who am I to stand here to teach the rest if I myself, I'm also grappling with this understanding and even my own living and my own journey. Right? So I pray that this whole introduction would have been helpful for you. Carry this within your heart. Listen to it again because when you come back next week, we're getting into basement one. 
But we are going up Mount Makarios. Amen? We come back next week, going our basement too, but we are going up Mount Makarios. Amen? I want to say to all of us, you are blessed. I don't want you to forget that. And so as we conclude, let's hold these few points in our hearts. Number one, the king is serious. He's very, very serious. Okay? Please don't reduce Jesus to some, uh, some friend joker kind of guy nowadays. Kawan, kawan, peng you, peng you. He's serious. He's king. He loves us. The heavenly father loves us. But the king is serious. Amen? And he's very serious with his kingdom manifesto. He states it openly, publicly, clearly. It's up to you whether you want to live this way or not. This manifesto is given to all who are disciples. And can I have your agreement that every person here and listening in, you are, if you are a believer of Jesus Christ, you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you are a disciple of Jesus Christ. It's for you, it's for me. But the best thing is that the King shows the way. He has shown the way. That's why you have to look to Jesus. That's why we sing, Jesus be the center of our life. You know, it's not just, just something that's inspirational. You're looking at His example of living this way from basement one to basement eight, but always on the top of Mount Makarios. That's the paradox of this entire message. He shows the way. You go read in 1 Peter, it says, you know, you follow in his steps, you know, that when he was reviled, he did not say anything, like a lamb led to the slaughter. If you cannot walk through a difficult moment, you have to look to Jesus. If someone is giving you a problem, someone is betraying you, someone has shortchanged you, you've got to look to Jesus. I can't understand your problems. I can't understand your experience because I have not walked in it. But there's someone who has been let down totally and he died for us on the cross. Amen? See, if we don't understand this, we don't understand the cross. We don't understand the cross, we can't look at it through the cross. We can't see this message through the cross. Then we miss it. Because when someone says, you have to forgive, easy for you to say, oh, I cannot. Look to Jesus. Look to the cross. You've got to view it through the cross. He was that sacrifice upon the cross for us. Amen. And it is through the cross that we have come into salvation, into the kingdom. And because He went to the Father, He gave the Holy Spirit. Where the law cannot be fulfilled through flesh, but by the Holy Spirit. And so we have to understand that. That we have to yield and we have to learn how to walk with the Holy Spirit. To hear that voice of God by the Holy Spirit. That prompting of God that would tell us how to live. And finally, to understand that if you want to possess everything about the kingdom, then you are first to be possessed by the king. So understand surrender. The world never teaches us this, but Jesus does, and he showed it to us. Amen? Come, let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we say thank you. We say thank you for the cross. Thank you for the sacrifice, yourself being on that cross. Thank you for showing us the way. Thank you for giving us the example. Thank you, Lord, for reminding us that the kingdom that we are talking about is not of this world. I pray, God, that you will open our eyes, Lord. Give us a fresh revelation to understand this deep within our hearts, Lord. Right there in the Spirit, O oh Lord. That, Lord, when we come to that understanding and come to that conviction, Lord, then it becomes clear that the kingdom we have received is one that cannot be shaken. Lord, when we walk through this world, Lord, there will be challenges. There will be, there will be difficult moments. There will be difficult people, Lord. And we are coming into a season, Lord, where we see reports around the world, Lord. Christians being persecuted. Christians being maligned. Christians being spoken against. Christians being called names. Christians being robbed of their freedom to worship you. Oh, Lord, may we understand that these are part of the body of Jesus Christ. And that, Lord, it might happen to us one day. But I pray, O oh Lord, 
that if we are in Christ, then we have that promise that comes from you. And I hear you declaring loud over all of us, Makarios. Oh, the blessedness of the people of God. If we would understand how to yield, how to surrender, that your rule and reign of the kingdom of the king will begin to take over from that point forth. And so I bless my brothers and my sisters. That Lord, if they're going through a difficult moment, I'm not minimizing it, Lord. But I'm just praying grace will be sufficient for them, to sustain them. And I pray, Lord, that your eyes will turn to see Jesus and to understand what it means to walk the way of the King. And so we give you praise. We give you glory. Lead us, Lord, over the next sessions, O oh Lord that we will always remember this, that we will learn what you want to teach us. Thank you, Lord. We bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.